Good afternoon. Wow, I am endlessly inspired by the courage we're witnessing in the room today. And speaking of courage, I'm honored to be here today to, at the 2022 Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy to present the International Women's Rights Award. This year, the 25 human rights groups that co-sponsor the Geneva Summit have chosen to recognize the extraordinary accomplishments of Zarifa Afari. In 2018, after successfully creating a women-focused radio station, Ms. Ghaffari, at age 26, was appointed mayor of Maidan Shah, becoming one of the only female mayors in Afghan history and the youngest. All of this, however, in a province where support for the Taliban is widespread. When the new mayor showed up to start work, she was mobbed by angry men armed with stones and sticks. She was forced to flee, whisked away by Afghan security forces. Yet despite death threats, Ms. Ghaffari came back, defying her fundamentalist critics and their narrative that a woman is unfit to lead. She then withstood a walkout by all of the male members of her office. In the face of this adversity, she demonstrated ability and courage in tackling her town's problems. She soon started implementing public works projects such as road repairs and successfully launched a Clean City, Green City campaign. She took to the streets with free rubbish bags and reduced littering. In a March 2021 interview, Ms. Ghaffari said, when I started my job, people would not accept a woman as a leader. They were ignoring me, laughing at me, and making challenges for me. After two years of work, what I am proud of is that the people of my city and those who watch me daily are believing in women's power, women's ability as leaders, and to serve in high office. Ms. Ghaffari faced death threats from the Taliban and ISIL and survived three assassination attempts. Tragically, gunmen killed her father in November 2020 and she believes it was the Taliban trying to intimidate her. In 2019, the BBC listed Zarifa Ghaffari among the 100 most inspiring and influential women in the world. In 2020, she was named by the US State Department as an international woman of courage. Indeed, Ms. Ghaffari's courage has inspired girls and women in her community and across the country as a trailblazer and door opener for a new generation of young women, she helped empower the women of Afghanistan. She stands for the principle that women belong in the public square in Afghanistan and in every other country around the world. When the Taliban took over the country in August, Zarifa was forced to flee with her husband, mother, and five sisters. Via Islamabad in Istanbul, she reached Germany where she received asylum and from where she now fights for human rights in Afghanistan and around the world. On behalf of the Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy, I am proud to present the 2022 Women's Rights Award to Zarifa Ghaffari. Ms. Ghaffari, please come forward to receive the award.
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for this prestigious award. Um, but I accept it, and I am accepting it on behalf of the unspoken woman of my country. Uh, the woman which saw the bodies being born, died, abandoned, and, they are, and now they are seeing their daughters, and they see themselves not able to at least enjoy their primary rights to education in my country. Afghanistan is the only one country around the globe where women or girls are not able to go to school. And I'm really broken down into pieces while just having a small short of sense statement from you and by saying, we are so sorry. No, man, we don't want you to be so sorry. You have to act at least now after seven months. And I'm so happy I'm receiving these awards and platforms at least now after, at, at least now after bringing the same previous stories and women rights abusers, government of Taliban back to power by international community in my country. But thank you. Thank you for those who recognize our efforts. Thanks for all those who, who believe on us. And finally, uh, after receiving an award, an award previously, every time, at least especially when my dad was alive, I was so happy by going home because the moment I was receiving the award, my dad was calling me and telling me she, he's so proud of me and he's waiting home for me. If nothing else, maybe my, my choice and my favorite dinner is ready so we can eat it all together. But, but this time, since long time, I don't have that dad calling me. And the same time, it's more broken and heart broken that I can't take this award to my home in where I belong to you. I, I request everyone to please put all your efforts and raise your voices and hands in support to stop extremism, stop war, stop horrifying activities around the globe, and stop all those terrorist activities which are somehow being funded by those countries which are named by human rights defenders countries. Please stop producing weapons. Please stop treading by women, by men, and by political activities which causes human beings' lives. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Zarifa. So I want to ask you, you, are, you served as Afghanistan's youngest female mayor, but what made you run for mayor in the first place? Uh, thank you so much. Actually, first of all, I think if you believe yourself, if you believe you're doing right, doesn't matter what and how, you will definitely follow your path. Secondly, it's about you know your work will make changes, and you know you believe that it's something that the people will definitely defend it and want it. And especially in my country, I believe that the people of my country are really terrified by men's leadership. So I thought they need women leaders to, to prove them that they can be changed they can change so many things if they have the opportunity. So I want to clear up a little bit of confusion here. It's widely reported that you were 26 when you became mayor, becoming the youngest. But actually, you were 24, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was, I'm born of 1994, 25 September 1994. Uh, but. Uh, due to the Afghanistan's uh, educational law and uh, procedures, you have to be at least 17 to go to university entrance exam. But I was 15 when I graduated from school, so 
I had to have my national ID card by 17 years old because in countries, in most of Asian countries, in countries like Afghanistan, you don't need to have a birth certificate exactly. Like you can have, you can have a date and have your national ID card. So I did like that, and um, uh, yeah, uh, I was 24 when I got appointed, and I am right now 27. And uh, but it feels great, you know, when people think I'm 30. I have in something in my heart that no man, I'm 28. <laughs> Well, you were even younger than most people thought you were, which uh, is even maybe. more admirable. But, so you're 24 years old, and you turn up, you want to go to work. It took you 10 months before you were actually able to take up your appointment as mayor. And we heard how there were uh, locals who were protesting, throwing stones at you, trying to kill you. And you're 24 years old. Weren't you scared? Actually, we have a normal saying in our language, like kind of phrase that if you are turning round, round, around a uh, big uh, problem and you are just witnessing it from so far away and not hugging it, then that really hurts you. But if you hug it, then, you know, that's something that you are able to control it somehow. So I think, uh, you know, for me, the problems started more before that. While going to school, I was injured four times for, uh, in the cases of several uh, attacks that were happening on my way to school, to different offices, governmental places, and but I was injured. Attacks by against you specifically? No, no, not me, but it was like public attacks and stuff happening, but I was injured. So for me, it was like not new. And most importantly, to risk your life for something that you believe that really works, I don't think it's simply, you know, something worse. And most importantly, that I believe always, we live, we are born to die someday. It's the fact of their life and the reality of the world and the life is. But it's more better to die in a battlefield for exact human causes, for human war, uh, causes, for the world perfect causes, than dying in a beat in a hospital. I always believe on that. Uh, but at the same time, living for a cause always makes you champion. But dying for a cause will make you part of memory and history. I don't want to be part of memory and history for a long time. I'm not trying to be so selfish. But yeah, I want to I want to make people believe on their powers and see if they try, they can definitely do. So taking this risk was like um, something that I, I thought it's needed. You know, we need to show something different. And indeed you did. You took up your appointment despite the intimidation. You turned up and you served as mayor for two and a half years. What are some of your proudest achievements of your time as mayor? Actually, uh, I, on 26th uh, February, uh, just a few days ago, I was, uh, a month ago, I was back home to Kabul after fleeing on a ghost. Uh, going there, I went to a far from village. And there I had a meeting with the elders of this village. And these men, the elders, were waiting two, three days for meeting me in that village. While I believe these men were never sitting with their wives and mothers and daughters to talk to them, but they were waiting for me to talk to me. When I went and sat with them and I started talking to them, they were asking me to help them for building a, a school building, high school building for girls in their village. And it was seriously amazing for me that one of them were telling me that we want our daughters as well to become like you so she can help her family and the rest her villagers. So I think this was what I won. I think this is the achievement. I believe this is the achievement. Secondly, uh, to, to exactly make changes in the mentality of those people who I was working in municipality office for starting, they were abandoning me and uh, rejecting, recognizing me. But later on, 
they were the one, the day I left my office at 9 June 2021, I left the uh, municipality office. Trust me, people were crying. I have the videos and all. And th this was, I think, this was the moment that they were believing women leaders. And I think that changed worth any kind of risk. That, that is incredible. Men went from trying to kill you or stone you, or at least, you know, even the nonviolent ones were protesting, and now they're asking for your help. I just want to clarify, the people who were asking you for help were not part of the government. Uh, actually, the ones who were uh, uh, protesting against me, they were from local government, they were from central government, and like one of the guys who was the key person for this uh, protest, his brother was advisor to president. Uh, so, uh, and he himself was working with a, a peace negotiation ministry. There was a ministry for peace. And at um, the same time, they, the, these uh, protesters was being fed by former uh, acting mayor, the one who couldn't succeed with uh, competition with me. So he was feeding these guys by money and at the same time, the go uh, governor of the province himself. Uh, so yeah, too many people were involved. So you mentioned you went back to Afghanistan in February. What was it like for you to see conditions on the ground, considering you had worked so hard to make your city a better place? What was it like going there now? You know, it's so hard when you're building a building of 10, 15, floors and then you're in the first floor seeing these all floors like just suddenly broken down one by one you know and at the end just to save your family life you have to you know you need to take them out and you are also out because of them you know and from that outside you are seeing this building that you were part of building it it's just went it's so hard I went back to Kabul, I saw so many uh, frustrating things. I saw people selling their kids on the streets. I saw people selling their body parts. I saw people se selling their house materials, like the poverty, the human rights crisis, the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the crisis with and the uh, uh, media staff, the, they are already abandoning media, the, the abuses of freedom of speech and the journalists, the activists, the kidnaps of women activists, uh, the arrests of so many main activists, uh, uh, as of them, like example, Azim Azimi, the guy who was protesting against uh, Pakistan's interferences in my country, he was taken uh, to prison by Taliban and he is a cell uh, mess and we don't know about whereabout of him. Uh, at the same time, the teachers, the doctors, the, 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 like the most intellectual and educated people are already left the country. They, they just left the country. And now, just because of, I believe, just because of the ban on girls' school, there will be a big amount of people leaving the country because now the, the Afghan people don't want their daughters to risk, like, uneducated. So situation was really f uh, worse. Uh, the, the public services uh, offices were closed. They were not able to function. Government is not totally functioning. The genocide, the, the brutally killings, the kidnaps, the, the me like everything is happening in that country. But it's not coming out because there's no media focus in Afghanistan right now. Uh, and the ones who are inside of the country, they are also in control of the Taliban, and they are also having uh, the bans, like ban on uh, on media. Media, uh, TVs, and radios are not allowed to publish women's song. They are not. Uh, they are not allowed to uh, play music. They are not allowed to have free speeches. Uh, the ones who were having, like previously, we had some of activists coming to media and having interviews, but they were just taken away by Taliban to prisons. 
So at the same time, the healthcare services for women especially, like primary one, the maternity healthcare services are just grind up. So everything is just a mess. I, uh, I was seriously, you know, I, I, saw, uh, I saw girls going to university, to Kabul University the day uh, after when I went to Kabul. But this, you know, but I, I was so happy for that, you know. It was a great thing happening to me seeing that. But just in the corner of that, I saw a big amount of women sitting just nearby a, a bakery, and they were begging just for one bread. And a big amount, like 30, 40 women. Uh, and this is like heartbreaking. Uh, we are, uh, you know, as I say, I just, I'm just witnessing the broken uh, type of my dreams. You know, there are some people who've applauded you for going back, but there are some people who have criticized you saying that you are whitewashing the Taliban, you're legitimizing them by having gone back. What do you say to your critics? First of all, I don't think I would have something special for, do for those because I think, uh, I believe if you know nothing and you are making a statement, this, this, is, al this is always like, you know, uh, because of your immaturity and because of your down level of knowledge and personality. So I think with that level people, I don't, I don't really make myself in trouble to talk to them or give them an answer. But yeah, I will definitely say two words. First, the ones who are criticizing my life, my personality, the attacks on me, the attacks on my dad, and all the, the murder of my dad and everything around my life, please wear my shoes and walk my way just for one day. If you do, if you dare, I would definitely answer all your words. Secondly, I think, you know, I went back to Afghanistan. I, I, I risked my life. It was not easy. I risked my life, I, and I'm, I'm not sure anyone is ready to do it that way I did, you know? But, but uh, I went there, I walked so well, the, the, the news is out, there is like, I always say, if anyone is having the proof of me making deal with Taliban or whitewashing the Taliban, okay, come forward. I'm so brave than so many men of my country. I will definitely take, uh, you know, make myself to be accountable for you. But if not like that, I'm definitely sure. Uh, the word no, I'm not afraid of death. So when I'm not afraid of that, whatever is coming next, I will put the judgment in front of the world's people. If anyone like thinks uh, I, I can be taken accountable, definitely I will, I will be, I will be. You are certainly very brave. You, you know, you've been such a role model. You've done so much in terms of really paving the way for women when they said it couldn't be done. If the Taliban were to now reach out to you and offer you a job in government, would you take it? I, I never worked for, uh, for a person in government. Uh, some of my criticizers are putting like Zarifa Ghaffari was former, former president's uh, like team's member. So that's why uh, now she's, uh, you know, somehow uh, she went to Kabul to lobby for Taliban. But man, if I was a, a, a team member for president, then I was not having nine months in, with, in trouble with my own, uh, you know, entrance to my office, the office that I wanted with competing with 138 candidates for that position. It was hard, I won it, but still I wasn't able to get in. So, uh, and this, so it means that I never went for any especially uh, governmental system. I worked as a mayor previously in government to serve my people and to be the voice of my people, especially to be, to prove women's power and leadership. And if uh, right now also, if the people of my country next time, whenever we have a legitimate, properly, equally, well-qualified and 
uh, you know, a well-settled government in Afghanistan. And then the people of my country, is in particular women, wants me to be their vices inside the government. Why not? I would love to. I would love to do it. But right now, I have nothing uh, in my mind for that because I think. Uh, I, I just need some time to at least get free and relieved with the, uh, with the horrors that happened to me by walking inside the government, uh, especially the loss of my dad. I think I need a bit longer time to come over the span and then once again get ready for that at all. But you, it's not like you're stopping work. You still have a humanitarian foundation that you're using and you're actually using this now to help women in your country. Tell, tell people a little bit about what you're doing there. Um, yeah, uh, I, uh, during my master's degree education in uh, India, I, I just founded on 2014 an organization in Afghanistan. Uh, that organization called Assistance and Promotion for Afghan Women Organization, where we are, the, the focus goal is education, self-empowerment, and newly we added the healthcare services as well within this. So uh, by after founding this organization, I had some staff by my own, and then I went to governmental offices, and then I like couldn't follow up with the organization. The day I flee from Afghanistan on 22nd August, I really reached Germany. It was the first ever thing on my mind to start back this organization because I thought this is the most important thing that I can do. We worked so hard and within two months we could start our first ever center for women in Kabul in the capital of Afghanistan where we are delivering free educational and vocational training for women. Uh, for 60 women in a time, and the same time, uh, uh, within this uh, vocational trainings, we have two classes of tailoring and handicrafts trainings. That all together, there are 90 girls or women studying in these classes, and we have a free maternity healthcare services center where we are delivering free maternity healthcare services from medicine to laboratory checkup, ultrasound, doctor, doctor checkups, and everything for free. And, um, and I'm so happy that within the uh, first two months, we could treat more than 800 uh, uh, needy women on this free maternity health care center. I did this by the, uh, the uh, sometime uh, the money or the donations comes for this activities. First, I did it uh, with a crowdfunding under my name, under my own name. I started a crowdfunding. And that was also not going the way I wanted it, but it still it helped me. And then some of my cash prizes. And finally, I sold out some of my gold jewelries. And yeah, the center is now the fifth month of the center, walking in Kabul, and we are planning to develop its activities to too many other places of uh, the country, other provinces of the country, because we believe most, whenever we are talking about nowadays educational staff in Afghanistan for women, mostly people are talking about online education, but online education is not working in my country. It's not exactly working because people who are not able to buy pen and paper or notebook, they are not able to buy internet packages, mobiles, laptops, or maybe whatever else to, to have that online classes. So the only best way is to provide them uh, these classes of educational classes, vocational classes, inside their own societies, by their own people, in support of their own community. So uh, this is what we are doing in Kabul, and uh, this is also why I started, because after being in Germany, I started learning and researching about situation. Then I realized that most important thing to a woman is education, health, and money. If you're a self-financed woman, then you have all your rights guaranteed. If you are educated, then you have everything already knowing about what you want. And then finally, if you are fine, your health is okay, you have your health facilities and 
services in your reach, then definitely you are a proper human being to fight for anything around you. So we started these centers now, and at the same time we are uh, uh, providing eight packages of uh, food packages to widow women, and most focus of my life is widow women because I am a daughter of a widow, my mom is, but my mom had me at least uh, as a elder daughter to take care of the rest sibling and my mom. Uh, but there are so many more widows in my country, millions of widows in my country that have no one. So I think it will be great if I could do something for them. It's absolutely great. You are such a role model to so many young women inside Afghanistan, the ones who can't go to school, the ones who can, the ones who are now going to some of your centers, but also to other women all over the world for your courage and, and what you've done. What is your message to all of those young girls who are looking up to you and, and looking to you for some direction today? I'm, uh, first of all, before making my uh, statement on this question, I'm really sorry to all men sitting in this room and all the ones who are listening to me online. With due respect with all good men of the world in my country, I'm also the daughter of a man who was badly proud of me and who was really, really like, uh, he was always telling me that you are my prayer. You're the only prayer of my life that God accepted. So I am, I'm so proud of being such a man's daughter, but still, I mostly believe I, uh, as a woman, as a girl, as a daughter, that we need to first believe ourselves, promote ourselves, educate ourselves, and let's be and learn and try to get the position of leadership of our own society and communities. Let's be the leaders of our communities. Because I think the world and the people of the world and the, the countries are tired, tired of this horrible politics, horrible decision, horrible leadership, horrible ideas and everything of main leader of our communities. This is the only thing I wish I could have it at least for, if, if my daughter comes next, this is like the wish for me. If I have a daughter next time or maybe in future, I, I, I really want to see into her eyes with so proud and tell her that girl, the rights that you are enjoying it now, I was the fighter for that. And train her to be a leader. If you have your daughters, train them as a leaders. Train them, teach them, and make them learn. Because the world needs peace, the world needs love, the world needs courage, the world needs, the world needs humans. And let's teach our people, our daughters, at least, to be that. And I think with this stuff, we women are so good on that because we women were not terrorists. We women were not part of destroying the world. We women, at least in my country, women are not Taliban, women are not Daesh, women are not Mujahideen, women did nothing to that country. And there are so many more examples around the world. So let's be the leaders of the, the, your countries, your communities, and take the lead before humanity dies and humanity feel ashamed of us as a being as a human being. Do you, Do you think women's rights can exist under the Taliban? They have no other option. If they don't really accept the facts of my country, I am just one example of the woman of my country. Just imagine, if we are millions all together, it will be so difficult for so many powers of the world to face us. Taliban are so small ones. And they have to accept these facts. If they are not accepting these facts, two things are happening. One, it's sure that they cannot run this country, and they cannot stay longer in that country. Doesn't matter, America supports them or UK or Europe. 
it really doesn't matter. This time, would they will be kicked off if, like, in a very bad way that they will never be able to return back if they are not accepting the facts of the country. And the women of that country are the greatest facts of this country. The greatest fact of this country. And secondly, they are paving to another civil war in my country. But we women, I, I think there are so many more Zarifas, millions of Zarifas in my country who are terrified with the death of their beloved ones, who are still not able to forget the feel, the pain, the shout, the cries of their siblings, their moms, their, their loved ones. I, I, when my dad died, when they murdered my dad, I was, I was in office and it was like now about 15 days I wasn't able because of security staff coming home. And then when I was on my way coming home, I received this call that my dad, they shot my dad. And I called my mom, is, she, is he alive? And the only thing was, no, he is not. And do you, do you know, I, going to hospital, I wanted to go and hug him so tight. Doesn't matter he's alive or not. But I wasn't able to do that because I, I just got that if I'm doing that, then no one is here to take care of my mom and my sibling. So, you know, I was trying to show off how brave I am while I was broken into pieces inside me because now anymore I didn't have that, that person who was proudly standing by my side and saying, doesn't matter who, who really attacks you, just go bravely, I trust you. And I think there's more money millions like me in that country. We know what the pain of war is. We know how horrible it is. And, and by knowing that, I think we are not allowing another one in my country. We have these horrific pictures of uh, Kabul airport on social media and on news where people were fleeing down from planes like birds. They were human beings. They were not birds. We had this river, a small river in front of the airport gate, which was full of blood, and the photos are still in, social, and in Google and everywhere. The river of blood, we were listening and hearing and reading it on, on books and the stories, but I saw it in my country in 2021. It's horrible. We know what exactly is this horrific terror, war, a stupid decision of the stupid leaders of the world. So we are not allowing this happen to our country once again. That's why I'm really not afraid of what Taliban are doing. They are just like kind of, you know, they are just re making ready, like kind of taking ready or maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe celebrating day by day their own deaths. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand to congratulate Zarifa Ghaffari.